I say this pretty much every year, but 2023 was a busy year of games for me. This year I played 34 different games for the first time, the vast majority of which are very good. Of course, only two will get my honorable mentions for Game of the Year and a triumphant one will take the coveted honor. But before that, I want to talk about the many games I played this year in chronological order of when I played them. Plenty of these are games that I've discussed on the channel before, but there are several I haven't, so stay tuned to find out more about my gaming year of 2023. Starting off with Bastion. Bastion was the first game I played in 2023 after finishing up Near Replicant early on in the year. Hard to believe it was that recent. Bastion was the final Supergiant game I had to play, and I had a good time with it. Supergiant produces solid games, and their first one was no exception. A short and worthwhile playthrough, and wonderful to see how the studio has developed since this game. We were here. I am always on the lookout for good online co-op games to play with one of my friends, and the We Were Here series seemed like a good one to check out. The puzzles were mostly fun, but we ended up not continuing after finishing the first game, in part because of the creepiness of a particular level. Still was enjoyable, just not one we felt any desire to continue playing. Fire Emblem Engage The first big release of the year for me was the newest Fire Emblem game. I enjoyed Engage's gameplay more than any Fire Emblem game since Awakening, and found the characters charming even with a more simple story than Three Houses. A middle-of-the-pack Fire Emblem game based on my rankings, but that to me is still a great time. Persona 3 Portable Okay, technically I played some Persona 3 Portable way back, but I'm counting this in the list as I finally took my playthrough seriously and beat the game. There is no video for this one though, because Reload was announced and I scrapped the planned video as I felt it would no longer be relevant or helpful. I'm glad I played Portable and got the experience even with the port's flaws. You'll hear more from me on Persona 3 in a few weeks. 8-Bit Adventures 2 This year was a good one for indie RPGs and 8-Bit Adventures 2 fit right in with that. I know there are plenty of people who haven't even heard of the game, but it is solid. A straightforward but really fun combat system, a deeper than expected narrative and characters, and solid throwback presentation. 8-Bit Adventures 2 shows that heart beats out budget every time. Trails to Azure the first of the Trails trio from this year, Trails to Azure is a fantastic conclusion to the Crossbell arc, and it's finally available in the West for everyone to see. There's not much else I can say. I'm just so glad that everyone has the chance to play the Crossbell games now and see how the SSS got started. Just as solid an official version as it was in the Geofront version. Octopath Traveler 2 Everything we could have asked for in a sequel, richer story with more connection between the characters and the world, a combat system that only slightly adjusted things but still made the system even better, and the typical fantastic art and music. This is the title that I think will solidify Team Asano as major figures in the RPG sphere for years to come. Terra Nil one of my relaxing games of the year is the city builder where instead of building a city, you are building up a new environment for all the nice critters to live in and then departing. The simple act of restoring the environment is an immensely satisfying one. I do still wish there had been more to the game and more replayability, but it was still a fun experience that people looking for a chill game with great art and cute animals should give a try. Battle Block Theater Another one of the co-op games I played with a friend, we'd played Castle Crashers, so Battle Block Theater made sense to try as well. Silly humor that some of the time worked and some of the time didn't, and a decent challenge along with some hilarious moments of teamwork. It's a classic co-op game for a reason. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Future Redeemed Yes, this gets its own entry on the list because there's just so much to this DLC campaign. Future Redeemed perfected the Xenoblade gameplay loop. The exploration is so enticing and every challenge satisfying to check off the list. There was no part of this game I didn't want to explore to the fullest and I 100%ed the DLC. Top it all off with an amazing send-off to the Klaus arc story-wise and this is a top-tier must-buy DLC. A phrase I don't think I've ever said in a video before. Fuga Melodies of Steel 2 our furry child soldiers are back, but this time they're chasing down the Tyrannus and their old foe, the Tarascus. The strategic gameplay is still there in even more refined form, and the story goes to some darker places than the original ever did. A more than worthy follow-up to the first game with the hints and seeds to a possibly epic conclusion in Fuga 3 down the line. Tales of Symphonia Remastered Bandai Namco vexes me when it comes to Tales, another shoddy port of the well-regarded Tales of Symphonia game that I was finally able to play. 
I did very much miss the advancements that later games would give to the Tales of Formula, but there is plenty of charm to Symphonia that it's easy to look past all that. This game deserves better. Heck, the whole Tales series deserves better. But Symphonia was able to shine through in some places anyways. Sable. The first game I ever started and did not finish on stream. For those who don't know, I streamed my efforts playing Sable over on Cerulean Skies and did have a generally good time with the game. When the game didn't bug out and lose me the item I needed to complete a quest. It was a gorgeous landscaped and characterized land. It did feel emptier than I would have liked, but I enjoyed the exploration aspects. Unfortunately, I fell out on playing it after a while and have not finished the game. Panorama. A game routinely compared to the excellent Dorf Romantic, Panorama has that same hexagon relaxing game element but with different goals in mind. You build up environments that eventually level up and grow as you place tiles with them. Unlock buildings and grow your burgeoning world. Very relaxing game, cute animals around you can click on to get points. It was very easy though, so the strategic element is missing, but for those who want a cozy sit down game, this is an excellent choice. Trails into Reverie. The concluding game for the Western Zumerian arc is a unique one, different structure from most of the Trails games while also easily following up on the few strands left to play with in Crossbell and Erebonia. I'd say the writing was a return to form on all three pathways, Seas Route especially, and the teases for the upcoming Calvard arc are more than worth a visit, another strong entry in the Trails series. The Escapist 2 Co-op game number 3! I played the original years ago, but I think this one is better. Plenty of fun challenges and I had a good time playing with my friend. Lots of tense moments as we made our escape along with some moments where we were just sitting around hoping someone would finally have duct tape for us to buy. So there's a mix of gameplay styles for you to enjoy. Lakeburg Legacies. A game that aesthetically is great, but is a mixed bag pretty much everywhere else. I still enjoyed the game, but there's a reason it has mixed reviews on Steam. The game is stuck between its ambitions and what it actually is, with both sides of the city building slash town management and relationship building more shallow than one would hope. There's an amazing game in here somewhere, but at the moment, it is an alright time for those prepared for some jank and incomplete mechanics. Trinity Trigger an action RPG in the vein of the Mana series, and a nice preview for Visions of Mana next year. A decent game with a lot of variety and augments for your weapons and characters. Design of the boss battles does bring down the overall score, but it's still a fun combat system. Art is nice to look at, and the story is decent as well. Bloons Tower Defense 6 This is a throwback from when I would play Bloons on browser, and they've done a lot since then. Didn't dive in too deep, but there are hero monkeys now and many, many levels and challenges to undertake. It's a classic tower defense game for a reason, but didn't keep my attention for too long. Oxenfree. This is the start of my discovery of the Netflix games catalog, and Oxenfree was a great start to that. A gripping mystery story with good character background and suspense. The biggest highlight to me is the dialogue system, which feels more like flowing conversation than any previous system I've experienced. Still haven't gotten to the sequel, but that'll probably happen at some point in the future. Virgo vs. The Zodiac An otherworldly timing-based combat RPG that has an interesting take on the Zodiac. I spent a lot of time thinking about the story and the art of making an unlikable protagonist that we may still end up rooting for in the end, and how to make an alien morality system. The combat system also has a surprising amount of depth and nuance to how you play. I think this is an underrated gem of a game. Into the Breach Also on Netflix games, Into the Breach gives you bite-sized strategy gameplay and quick campaigns that are nevertheless the best strategic challenge I had all year. It's so tightly constructed and fantastically addicting once you're into it. The odds may be daunting, but it is rare that you can't manage to win anyways with good strategies and forward thinking. It also works great on phones and tablets, which you need to play Netflix games. Sea of Stars This is one that's going to appear on a lot of Game of the Year lists, and I get why. It is a loving homage to classic RPGs with a brilliant artistic style and some fun turn-based combat. However, I'm going to be honest, Sea of Stars has become largely forgettable to me since my playthrough of it. The story didn't hook me, and the gameplay system stopped innovating and introducing anything new about halfway through the game. I still enjoyed the game, but it could have been so much more. Eternites A single person created this game, and it's a great time. Short, but great. I think the heart of the game is in the right place and the performances really help carry the story. 
There's some cringe writing, the action combat isn't as smooth as I would like, and the social calendar is a watered down Persona version, but it is a very interesting game at the very least, and I hope heralds a long career in the industry for its creator. Legend of Nyata Boundless Trails This game got me right in the PSP Falcom games nostalgia. Every part of the game is good, the story has lovable characters in a charming world, the platforming and combat feels so good and easy to get into, the presentation is impressive for the era it came out in, I think this game is a perfect introduction to what Falcom does well when given the time and drive to do so. Button Kaitos Remastered I played the first game of the two game collection and Button Kaitos impressed me. Not all of its systems worked great, but it was all in service for a good game anchored by an impressive story. I won't talk more about it for those who want to experience it blind, but Bot and Kaito's got me hooked and hopefully Origins can do the same, but maybe with a little more polish of the gameplay systems. 20XX My most recent choice of co-op game with my friend is the roguelike game inspired by Mega Man, and we've had a good time going through the levels and learning how to play and beat the various bosses. It took some time, but we are now at the stage where we can beat all 8 bosses in a single run if things line up well in boss and level order. The ninth level, though, is an absolute nightmare. We may never see the end of this point. I hope that's humorous exaggeration. Dead Cells Another Netflix game entry, and this is the one I'm most intrigued by because I was having a good time playing, but I kept thinking, this would be so much better on PC. I did drop it because I think that's when I will play it next, is when I can play it on PC, because this game seems so good it deserves to be played on the platform where I can properly explore and give it a chance. Star Ocean The Second Story R You want to know how to make a remake? Study this game. It is gorgeously rendered in the times it is faithful to the original and revamped for the better when it doesn't follow the remake. That being said, there are some things that just don't seem to work for me with the Star Ocean formula, specifically with regards to the characters and story. I like the ideas and just wish the characters had more of a chance to shine. Persona 5 Tactica One of the last big releases for the year for me was the fun strategy spin-off of Persona 5. It was pretty much as I expected on the gameplay side of things, with some clever incorporations of core Persona mechanics into a strategy RPG setting. The story also was a pleasantly good experience compared to my expectations. I know many might want or expect more, but I was satisfied with this game. Raft Another multiplayer game that I played with a group in a memorable stream over on my friend Nem's channel, along with old friend Golden Drummer 730 and new friends Shaky and Wolf Jinxy. A chaotic time that gave us a lot to do and constant pressure to keep going that kept us all on our toes. Definitely the survival co-op game I'd go back to if given the chance. Against the Storm Came out of early access in early December, and before things got busy for me on the holiday and video front, I got a chance to dive in and I loved it. This is the game I'm most excited to continue playing in 2024, because the unique roguelike city builder has gameplay like no other. I've only scratched the surface and I am ready for more. You may hear more from me on this game in the future. Suica Game Yes, at the last minute I jumped on the trend, and I kept the appeal. I also was unexpectedly frustrated by the game. I had played a knockoff version and was able to easily get to nearly 3,000 points and then played the real one and nothing was going the way I expected. I didn't pick it up when the trial ran out, but I'm glad I gave it a try. And that's all the games I played for the first time, with exceptions to Trails to Azure and Persona 3 Portable, this year. After examining all the games I played this year, it did take some time, but picking the game of the year wasn't too hard. Picking the honorable mentions, though, was a nightmare, because there were so many games that felt good but not great, or great but not amazing this year. I've had years with lots of amazing games, or years with plenty of good games, but I think the sheer quantity and closeness of their quality made this a particularly difficult year to choose, which is why my honorable mentions have turned out the way they have. Let's get on with the first honorable mention, which goes to... Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Future Redeemed. Yes, my first honorable mention is the DLC of my 2022 Game of the Year. Your question being? When I was thinking about the games I had played this year, Future Redeemed was the closest to flawless. It is rare that a DLC additional campaign makes the original game better and does a great job on its own as well. 
the Xenoblade series is the only series I've found that has managed to do this since XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. A tight, compelling story that concludes the Klaus arc amazingly while leaving open plenty for the continuation of the series, which you can find out more about in my Xeno series future video. Then we have the gameplay itself. The exploration is the Xenoblade formula perfected. Everything felt like an adventure to find and worth it once I did. It was a meaty game with as much or more content than plenty of main games, which is why I think it is worthy of this spot. I will say that given more time with the game, Against the Storm may steal this spot, but Future Redeemed is what I want from additional story DLC from all series from now on. Trails 2023 Yes, I'm cheating, but this year, of all years, I think I should get an exception. 2023 is the only year when three Trails games, two mainline, one spin-off, got released, all of which are amazing in their own right. Trails to Azure as the conclusion for the Crossbell arc is a fantastic game with one of the best conclusions in series history. It is not flawless, but the peak moments of Azure are among the best in the entire series. It is so great that the Crossbell series is now officially out and people can see the duology for the masterworks they are. In the middle, we have Trails into Reverie the concluding game for the Western Sumerian side of the series. There is so much going on in this game, and most of it is amazing. The final game of the traditional turn-based combat makes it the most lively and enjoyable, and also not too broken, system the series has seen. The story and its unique structure makes this a Trails game like no other, and all the arcs, but especially C's, are so well written. It reinforces just how important and continuous the development of the characters is in this series. That definitely goes for our main three, but there are still plenty of chances for other characters to shine and show continued growth. Then of course we have the excellent previews for Calvar to get us hyped for Trails into Daybreak. Reverie is the whole package. After those big long Trails games then, the year ended with a perfect bite-sized adventure with all the great elements in the form of Legend of Nyata Boundless Trails. The action RPG spin-off gave us a fresh gameplay experience that is so easy to get into and enjoy. The seasonal variants of the levels keep you coming back for new challenges and gorgeous art. The game was updated brilliantly with the character art, voice acting, and other quality of life features. The music, dear Kreha, is this a great soundtrack, and even though it's a shorter game, there's still plenty of content, plus an after story for those who want more. In short, these three are a perfect trio of traditional and non-traditional Trails titles, and I never got tired of any of them. There can only be one Game of the Year, though. And my pick for this year is the first from this company and series ever. I do think there are still some design flaws, but in addition to being my Game of the Year, this game would also get the award for Biggest Improvement in a Sequel Award. My 2023 Game of the Year is... Octopath Traveler 2. Octopath Traveler 2 is a better game in practically every way from the original, and I still really enjoyed the original. Octopath 2 has a set of memorable characters and a more engaging interwoven story with more interesting plot structure and development than the previous game. An ending that people can actually access without annoying design and divorce from the original plotline. The combat is even better with the addition of latent powers. The day and night cycle is an inspired addition and visually the game looks the best the HD 2D system has looked. With a solid base to build from, Team Asana was able to take amazing steps that formed Octopath 2 into a game that fans of the first game would adore and detractors acknowledge as a significant improvement. I enjoyed every hour that I put into this game, and I think in this year, Octopath 2 had the perfect blend of gameplay, story, presentation, sheer amount of content, and more to offer. Which is why Octopath 2 is my 2023 Game of the Year. How many games did you play this year, and what were the particular standouts? I'm hoping next year to play quite a few, but maybe not as many games so I can have more time to enjoy them all. But I already got two more new games in the last week, not to mention all the releases already scheduled for 2024, so that might be sunk already. Soon though I'll be making another video on those games, so make sure you're subscribed to catch that video when it drops. Thank you for another wonderful year on the channel, and have a great end to the year. Have a great day, and happy gaming.